Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the ISOC for having me. Uh, so I'm going to make a really simple point, which was uh, Dave mentioned I was doing telecom policy back in the 90s. Back in the 90s, it was, uh, it was, it was a good business to be in because it was pretty technocratic, uh, arguing over facts largely. Uh, today it's, it's anti-technocratic, it's largely ideological and highly politicized in a small P way. Uh, and so there's two big visions for broadband right now. There's sort of what you call the status quo vision, which is the current framework, which is largely about modest or limited regulation, smart role for government on things like helping with universal service and adoption and things like that, and opening up spectrum and largely relying on market competition uh, to drive this. And another vision, which is uh, saying that we don't have enough competition, we need much, much more competition. And for some of those people in that debate, that we really shouldn't even have privately owned networks, that this is, a, this is sort of a back to the future populist era view, that really these are inherently public goods, we need publicly owned networks. Now, if you're in that latter camp, you have to make a very compelling case to overturn the status quo policy regime. And what is that case that you would make? That case is essentially that the current status quo policy regime is failing to provide Americans with good broadband in terms of deployment, adoption, price, and speed. How would you do that? Well, you can't really do that just looking at ourselves. Is, is our speeds good enough? Hey, I don't know. Our price is good enough? I don't know. You have to look and look internationally, and that's what people do. So I want to talk just very quickly about what do we know internationally uh, about that, and when you look at that, which, which side do you end up on? The, the current system's working pretty well with some tweaks, or we need to radically overthrow that system and replace it with one that's much more government intervention. This is a report we recently did that went through all that. Okay. Basically, again, assessing U.S. broadband health, we've got to look at four dimensions. Deployment, that means the networks itself. Adoption, meaning how many people subscribe. What are the price they pay, and what, is the speed, what are the speeds they get? When you look at deployment, I think one of the mistakes a lot of people make, they, they, they talk about adoption, and then they can, aha, we have terrible networks because we only have 70% adoption. It's not really the right question. The right question is how are our networks? We actually have the third best deployed network system in the world. Um, uh, I pressed the wrong button here. Wait a minute here. There we go. Um, uh, so, the third best deployed network system in the world, and it's uh, intermodal in basis. A lot of other countries, particularly Europe, just have one network. We have two, and we have it to a lot of, a lot of homes, a 95% of homes, 96 Now, the next question is adoption. Everybody says, oh, we have low adoption. But why, why do we have low adoption? We have low adoption for one reason, one reason, and that's that we have about, with the exception of Mexico and maybe Greece, we have about the lowest percentage of Americans who own a computer. Now, I don't know about you, but I really am not going to get uh, broadband at home just because I think it's a cool thing if I don't have a device to use it on. It's like buying a refrigerator without electricity. Now, if you look at this, which is what's the adoption rate for people who have a computer at home, you find that we're very close to the top. We're four percentage points away from the real leaders. So that's the problem in America. It's computer adoption, and that's a proxy really for uh, digital literacy, interest, uh, there's just a lot of more, uh, we, have, we have a much higher share of U.S. population who are low income compared to other countries, we have a much higher share of American population with low levels of literacy. We just have a tougher demographic uh, environment in which to get to universality. Uh, uh, Bob also mentioned wireless, we lead the world in uh, LTE wireless adoption right now, which is uh, obviously a great thing. Speed. Uh, you hear sometimes that we're 22nd in speed. Well, we were, but we're not. That was about five years ago. Uh, actually, our networks have, have increased their speeds faster than many, many other places. And what you find now is that uh, American speeds, uh, average network speed, American speeds is 29. Uh, yeah, there are some countries that are ahead, uh, but we have actually increased our network speeds uh, faster. Uh, we're actually about the seventh fastest growth of network speeds uh, in, in the world in the last five years. So yeah, we're not Korea, we're not Japan, which uh, if you've been to Korea or Japan, you'll know. You'll know. France and Germany. Uh, it's in the report, and I don't remember what they are. Uh, I think we're faster than France and Germany, but I'll have to look and see, so I can do that while after I finish. Price, uh, you hear a lot about the fact that we have low, we have high prices in the U.S. 
Actually, what we have in the U.S., and I'm just really skipping this through this fast because I'm supposed to stick to five minutes. Uh, we actually have the second, this is Yokai Benkler study from Yale, we have the second lowest introductory price in the OECD. So if you just want kind of basic broadband, a meg or two, you can get the second lowest price in the OECD. So this notion that low-income people uh, are not adopting broadband because of somehow a failure of our network prices, that's just simply wrong. Uh, now what you see is that our prices at the high end, at the in high end in terms of speeds, tend to be higher. So we actually have uh, progressive pricing. Uh, other countries' prices are flat. We tend to have progressive pricing. Now why is that? Uh, it's not profits. Everybody says, oh, well, profits, profits are the reason the prices are for a 30 megabit connection in the U.S. are fat higher than they are in France. It's not profits. Actually, uh, French pro broadband profits are uh, significantly higher. Uh, in fact, one of the darlings of the CLEC movement that everybody cites is a company called Free in Europe. Uh, free profits are actually one of the highest profits uh, you can find in a, C in, a, in, a, in a broadband provider, and that's because they make interconnection fees on BOIP calls. So it's not profits. Uh, what are the factors for high for price? It's high costs. Let's get real. We have the second highest, uh, uh, second lowest, uh, if you will, urbanicity and the density. Only Australia has a. Bob mentioned uh, it's hard to put stuff out in the Rocky Mountains. We, we're the we have the second least densely populated country uh, uh, in terms of what's called urbanicity. So basically, spread out homes, suburbanized. It's a lot more expensive to put networks into suburban. Uh, uh, an exurban uh, geography than it is to put it in, say, the Tokyo uh, geography. Uh, second, uh, other third reason is subsidies. Uh, the Japanese, the Koreans, they have subsidized their network bills uh, through taxpayer dollars at a much higher rate than we are. So yes, you can do that. You can get uh, lower prices. So what are the issues that we have to tackle? Uh, really, one of them, and the major one, uh, if you saw our event yesterday, everybody agreed that this was a pretty important one. Uh, is, is really adoption, is digital literacy adoption. It, we get two great things from that. A, we get a population that's able to do more, uh, including e-government. The second thing is we make the economics for broadband deployment a lot better. So if you, you've, broadband is, is an industry with, as Jeff will say, high fixed costs, low marginal costs, and sometimes the advocates forget about the first and only look at the second. It's actually both are important. If you get a lot more people on the network, you can support uh, more investment because of that. Uh, we do need subsidy programs for uh, high cost areas. This notion that, by the way, that somehow these network providers are doing something wrong by not investing in areas where they can't make any money, like, yeah, that's because they can't make any money. Uh, why would we expect them to do that? It's incumbent upon public policy to fix that problem, not to, not to uh, coerce, coerce or uh, networks. Uh, we need much more spectrum, uh, and a number of different reasons, including government spectrum uh, and including uh, um, uh, broadcaster spectrum. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Trudy?